Everybody, thanks for watching and thanks for taking the time to purchase and support and welcome to book 16 in the biblical bible series which will be the continuation of ezra book 15 and we'll get into nehemiah here so we left off with ezra and um before we could finish digging into ezra we had to get into a lot of ancient history dealing with the greeks you know and the persians and all that you know pertains to um the bible and how they are fitting themselves within uh, the Bible's history and uh, real history. So if you haven't seen those videos, definitely want to go back and check it out or you'll be lost in this video. Um, that's a lot to get into, but um, we're going to pick up where we left off, which is basically where you have the Roman Empire, you know, finally conquering the Greeks after the long, you know, over a hundred year war. And um, the Greeks basically being assimilated by the Roman Empire and basically, you know, creating Christianity, taking the gods of the Greeks, uh, Jews, which everybody else would say the Jews, but when you look at it, we would say the Greeks because the Greeks is the one who gave it, gave it to us. So what you have now, as I said, the Persians spring back up. Persians rise in power and the Persians, you know, they go on the uh, offensive against Rome, of course, because they're probably pissed off about being defeated before. And since the Greeks don't exist, then uh, Rome is the best you know, place to attack since they now occupy the territories that the Persians once occupied. So we get into this whole thing. And it's a year um, where it's a year where you have so many people you know, around this time um, trying to figure out this whole Christianity thing, you know, just going back to the. Um, first century AD and um, you have all this stuff going on you have Rome basically around this time conquering and establishing their civilizations you have the rise of Christianity and just like remember we're talking about a religion that's spreading but you know if you don't have the book you don't know what's going on you are at the mercy of the people who's teaching it so it's a lot that Rome is involved in around this time so to fight a war that lasts over 700 years it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, actually. It's like, you know, how can we fix this? But nonetheless, the Persians was relentless. The Persians, you know, didn't stop um, attacking. And um, it says here, the ancient Roman Empire stretched from Syria to Britain. Keep that in mind, Britain. Only one power could challenge Roman arms on anything approaching an equal footing. The Persian ruler of the land that now comprises Iraq. This area, the location of numerous ancient civilizations, was the heart of the Persian Empire that stretched from modern Pakistan to the Syrian border. Two dynasties ruled the Persian Empire, the Parthians, which even when you hear that name, Parthian, that is Greek. You know, I mean, think about it. I mean, they're giving it away. It's Greek, Parthian. It's a Greek name. And, you know, it's probably converted from whatever they were speaking, but even still, they're giving you the hint, it's Greek. So you have the Parthians, that's uh, two 
38 BC to 227 AD, and later the Sassanids from 227 to 651. And we know the Sassanids was conquered by the Caliphates, or the Caliphates, which is the Arabs. And it says, Persians had established the capital of Tessaphon 35 miles from the site of modern Baghdad during the following centuries. As they became great empires, Roman Persia fought many wars. The Romans attacked Tessaphon more than a half dozen times and on five occasions in the second and third centuries AD. They took the city by storm. Roman victories in Iraq were transitory and self-defeating. So now you gotta understand, it's the same situation that happens here, which is how you know this is what they have done. So you have this war long war going on hundreds of years between the roman empire and the persian empire how is it all this time pass years pass and nobody noticed the rise of the arab people especially the persians being so close now when you look at it you know saudi arabia is where the arabs began saudi arabia arabs um saudi arabia is where the arabs came from where they sprung up from so Rome or the Greeks or the people in power basically did the same thing. You got this long war you're fighting with the Persians. And understand, at this time, Rome is trying to establish uh, Christianity. So you can't have, you can't be walking around preaching all this holy stuff and talking all this stuff and got this brutal war going on, even though this is exactly what Rome would do later anyway. But I suspect that the powers that be had this civilization growing long before Rome uh, uh, came into power or before um, the Persians, I should say, sprung back up. They began creating these people the same way they did before with the Persian Empire. You have basically Arabs, which is basically the same as Persians, mixing in with the uh, people in the Indus Valley and the people in India. So again, this is one of those things that a lot of people don't really look at. You have to think about it. You know, you're taking over territories around this time. You're on a conquering spree and you're going to many different civilizations to figure out, you know, uh, what's taking place and what the people are doing in certain areas and so on and so forth. You would think a civilization that grew as fast as the Arabs did, people would have known about. Somebody would have been talking, they would have been trading. And that's the thing. You have to trade with people. Somebody would have been trading with these people and this would be how they would be getting supplies in from wherever, even though Saudi Arabia does have a coastal you know, line uh, uh, by the Red Sea. And um, you can get ships in that way, which it still makes it more, you know, uh, sure that people was trading with these people. So they had to be known or they had to know that these people exist. And once you go there, I want you trading with these people. You can see how big their empire was and how many people they actually had. And for the Persians not to have, you know, you know, uh, done this research or seen this is, is, is suspect. But I suspect that the Greeks or whoever the powers that be is did the same thing. And it makes sense that they would have these people created. Okay, we got rid of the Persians, but let's go ahead and create, begin to create another civilization that we could have as pawns because this one worked so well for us with the Persians. They just didn't realize the Persians would spring back up. Or maybe they did and just the Arabs, you know, creating them was just, you know, um, you know, insurance in case they did rise up, even though it took them hundreds of years to finally, you know, come and conquer. So basically what you have happened, as I said, you have in uh, 628 AD, you have the end of the war. You have the war between the Persians and the Romans and then in the status quo antebellum, as I said before, 628 AD. And then you have the Arab leader um, Abu Bakr or Abu Bakr basically send his general, uh, General Al-Walid, to go and attack the Persian army. And this was uh, around 633 AD. They go and they attacked the Persians, and it was a bunch of skirmishes back and forth. And it basically led to the overall destruction. I mean, it completely ran through the Persians easily by 651 AD. And that was the end of the Persian Empire, and that was basically the, the fall of Zoroastrianism and the rise of Islam. So when you look at this in history, when you're looking this up, researching this, you'll see it called the Persian Islamic War, which it can't be. And this is to make it as if Islam was always around in here. And they always like to put it was the Islamic War, Islam, Islam, Islam. And you can't do that because one, remember, we're talking about uh, 633 is when um, General Awali went and attacked the Persians. There was no 
Islam then. Uh, the prophet Muhammad didn't die till what, 632 AD. So they attacked him the year after he died. And Islam didn't come on the scene and wasn't really established until you know, years later, uh, late 7th century. So it wasn't, you know, Muslims attacking the Persians. These people were Christians and uh, Jews that wasn't attacked. And it was just a civilization of people who was, you know, pagan, Christian Jews, all different kinds of stuff. But it, it's clear that... Um, they was they was trained. Talk about the people that's been fighting for centuries. I mean, who beat you before? It was the Greeks. So of course, if the Greeks is controlling or the Romans, Greeks and Romans is controlling the Arabs, they would have the strategy of how these people fight and the best way to attack them, which is probably how the Arabs, you know, completely ran through them. Even though a lot of people say it was just sheer numbers the Arabs had over the Persians, and it was able to just wipe them out in, in numbers alone. But um, you got to look at it and and, and you know, you ask yourself, how could even still, you know, the Persians so long been fighting, how were they able to, to beat them? So when you start to look at this thing and you see, you know, it don't add up. Something is wrong. No way they could have not noticed these people developing and, you know, no way they could have not seen the Arab Empire grow to, you know, the power that it became. So when you start to put this thing together, right, you have... Five years after the status quo antebellum, you know, Persians decide to go their way, Rome decides to go their way. You have five years after this, the Arabs attack the Persian Empire and they destroy the Persian Empire and they do in less than 20 years what the, what the Roman Empire couldn't do in over 700 years and that's defeat the Persians easily. So we're talking about Rome combined with the Greeks now, you know, having all these different civilizations couldn't somehow defeat the Persian Empire, which, you know, the numbers were supposed to be like super large for the uh, Persians when they came because they understood how powerful Rome had become and their numbers, they wouldn't attack if their numbers wasn't, you know, close to theirs, which is why it was, you know, such a long war. But just think about how large the Arab Empire would have had to be to attack the Persians and defeat them in less than 20 years uh, when Rome couldn't do it in over 700. So then you have this happen. They get rid of one religion and accept the new one, which is Islam. And it just so happens that Islam has the same prophets and, uh, you know, as Christianity and Judaism. I mean, think about that. So that, that's telling you right there. You got to think about, as I said before, the people up top is ruling, but you still have to worry about the people, you know, that you're ruling over. You can't expect these people. I mean, why would they accept Christianity, uh, uh, gods, Christian gods um, for their religion? And that is because most of them was Christians and Jews anyway. And it's just like we see with the Hebrews today. They looked at the religion and they were saying, well, something is wrong. This don't seem right. And then when you hear about Islam, it makes more sense because it fits their people. You're talking about a prophet that looks like them. They are more willing to hear that than to hear about, the, you know, pale face Jesus and so on and so forth. And they're thinking, well, this is the way it's supposed to be, supposed to have been. You know, you guys have been lying to us and they're more accepting of that, especially when you uh, build a society based on that religion. So it's basically these people are born into the religion. The whole society is, is based around it. So um, we look at this and we look at the Saudi empire. I mean, the Saudis have had good relations with America since 1933. It's a long time. You know, we have only disagreed on a couple of little teeny things, but has, there has always been a good relation between America and Saudi Arabia. And we've seen the Bushes holding hands with them. They have a king. How, how do they have a king? Think about this. How do they have a king? They have a king in a royal family just like the Europeans do. It's not a coincidence. And you have the Bushes holding hands with them. You have Obama kneeling to them. I mean, think about this. And you have so much interaction with these people um, being at the control of Islam, you might as well say. So now they're basically a tool for the powers that be. So now when you go back and look at all the little skirmishes and all the problems that we was having in the Middle East, they can basically use their asset, which was which would be the Arab people, to go ahead and launch attacks and cause problems which the powers that be could use 
to go on ahead and you know pass new laws or get more money from the government. So, who was the president during 9-11? Bush. A Bush was president. Who is said to have been involved with 9-11? Saudi Arabia. You know, it seems like a huge conflict of interest. It was the Bush administration that allowed the Bin Laden family to fly out, you know, after 9-11. When nobody else could, these people was allowed to go and leave because they knew they was going to be dropping Bin Laden name and they went and have it to their friends. And we know the Bin Ladens and uh, the Bush family were super close. So it's like, come on, Obama coming and bowing. And not only that, Obama doing something that a lot of people don't realize. And that is basically giving billions of dollars to Saudi Arabia. Uh, excuse me, selling billions of dollars worth of arms to Saudi Arabia. So they have a deal that's basically when a deal is done, it's going to be like three hundred and something billion dollars worth of arms that Saudi Arabia is going to buy from the American government. And what did we see in the news recently about, you know, Iran? We seen America basically accuse Iran of bombing a processing plant in Saudi Arabia. So what is this telling you what's going to happen? Of course, as I said before, Iran is going to be the next war. There's nobody left. There's nobody left. Iran is next. And you have to look at the fact that recently they have been comparing Donald Trump to Cyrus King of Persia, which is important. You got to look at this, that now at this time where this part of the Bible fits in our history today, and we have Trump being compared to Cyrus King of Persia, and I'm giving you guys these books that we can look at the Bible and see how what it's alluding to is coming into play today with Donald Trump. And these countries is involved that the Bible is speaking about being the Middle East and being Iran and the Persian Empire, so on and so forth. That is all coming into play now. And they are comparing Trump to Cyrus, King of Persia. It's not a coincidence. And when you go back and look um, at the... Uh, Saudi Arabian Empire during the time when they actually had Iran because Iran separated from them or could be just another tool. Who knows what, what's going on? But uh, it seems as if from the way we're looking at it as if they don't have control over Iran. But at some point in Saudi Arabia, the, the Arabs did. And um, we know one of the reasons or one of the ways they was uh, able to defeat the Persians easily is because the Persians were stupid and they came into Iran and the hills there is it's impossible to defeat them in Iran it's, it's tough it's hard today would be a lot easier but on foot you're going to get slaughtered this is what America did to Saddam basically um, you know push his buttons and get him to go ahead and attack to attack Iran probably to see how strong the defenses was what did, their, their defenses were strong. They basically wiped out most of those people that came in from Iraq to attack Iran. Um, they dug in. The only way to get them out is to drop bombs on them anyway, uh, if you can get planes near there because, you know, they have good weapons. But you see that in the news. You see this whole accusations of Iran attacking Saudi Arabia. And again, these are tools. It's a tool of the powers that be that they're going to use to cause another war, you know, uh, or so it seems. See, we as uh, the American people have, we are looking at this. We're looking at this whole thing and we're, we're believing that it's just, you know, people who spring up out of nowhere and, um, you know, they're, they're just trying to establish their religion and so on and so forth. And then when you get into Islam itself, these people are peaceful. That's a fact. And these people are within their own world. If you go out, I've been there, I've been in Iraq, and you can see these people, they don't bother nobody. What's, I mean, they are peaceful people. It's like, what's going on that you would have the balls to do some of the attacks that they have done um, involving America? Unless America is at the control or the powers that be is at the control of the people who are in power. And that's what it was. We know they control Saddam. We know they control them. So what they can do is, you know, from remote control, create these attacks, create these problems that's going to cause the American government to react and more tax dollars to come from us to pay for a war for something that's, you know, from us. As I said, in order to get the people to basically go along with you conquering everything, you have to always make sure there's a threat. So we had, I mean, just going all the way back, Persians and then you have the Arabs 
and then you know you have freaking uh now korea we had japan we had the nazis and so on and so forth it's always a threat and when you go back and dig into each one of these threats you'll see the hand that's controlling it all it's the powers that be just that simple we proved that with pearl harbor we know that was us we know that we had you know uh deals with japan and we allowed japan to do what they did we know hitler was a rothschild you know he was he was basically created to do exactly what he did and it's not a coincidence he's talking about aryans 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 aryan aryan race aryan blood that goes all the way back uh to, to, to the Greeks, it goes back with the Aryans creating the Persian Empire, and it's just an um, excuse to get the German people to buy into what Hitler was trying to preach. And if you got that kind of mindset with the Euro which the Europeans had, they bought right into all the nonsense. So, you know, Aryan blood and Aryan. It was all garbage. Hitler up there screaming his freaking brains out, bunch of garbage that sound good to them, and they bought it. They bought into it and they went and sacrificed themselves and died for a bunch of people they don't even know exist. And it's stupid. And it's these people are all being controlled. They're all puppets. So when we go back, I'm talking about all these wars that we can go back. It's outside of um, their control. It's very few. You know, once they took America, they basically had mostly everything. And the wars we have been seeing, it's been them. You know, we say the Rothschilds are at the head of all the wars and so on and so forth. And what they do is same thing they did before. Okay, we're gonna make the Arabs attack these people. Go back and pay attention and look at all the wars Arabs have started and everything that's been happening in that area involving Arabs going in going in and attacking things and then people calling for America for, for help. But really what it is the Europeans saying, you know, we're gonna use our asset to go and attack and then we're gonna tell the American people about it so we can justify us spending their money to go in there and do something. And every time is an easy an easy defeat because all they're doing is, you know, sending our troops out there to go and fight their troops. So, you know, there's nothing happening to you. You don't really care about these people. So we thinking that, okay, well, they care about, it's, it's their boys and they care about, you know, the soldiers and the troops. They don't care about these people. Go and fight this fake war against these soldiers that we created. I don't care who died. At the end, we already know what the outcome going to be, but it got to be some fighting so everybody can believe that this stuff is real when we know what's going to happen. And that's what it is. So, you know, the Arab powers and their Arabs out there, the people out there to go and fight. We send our people out there to go fight. We got military strategists and so on and so forth to figure out ways to kill these people. And it's set up. It's WWE from the rip. Plain and simple. It don't matter who win the fight. They know what's going to happen at the end. The people at the top are all in on it together, plain and simple. So you have the powers that be controlling all these leaders. And then when you look now at Islam, it's spreading. You look, as I said before, you have Thailand, you have China, you have all these Asian countries now converting to Islam. You know, they seeping into different parts of the world so they can get established and eventually, you know, control and take over these, these regions when the time comes. So, you know, we can't believe that China and, you know, places like Cambodia and stuff like that, um, uh, which is part of China, uh, China runs them. But Thailand and so on and so forth is just going to, you know, Vietnam, it's going to be fine. Let them take over and it's going to be cool. The reason why they don't have to attack these people is the same reason why they don't have to attack, they don't have to attack the tribes um, in Africa. It's because they live primitively. They're not trying to build industries and they're not trying to build you know, corporations and companies to rival them in any way. They just live in their lives as indigenous, you know, tribal type people. So they're, they're no threat to the powers that be. So they basically left alone, but they got stuff in place just in case. So we have seen, you know, uh, right after the time I left Thailand, I was reading about the bombings. Like probably the day after I left Thailand, it was a bombing there at one of the temples, which is like, oh, this is Muslim related. How could they bomb a temple? Like the monks is so peaceful. Like how could you do that? And we've been seeing, you know, the Muslims destroying stuff and artifacts and so on and so forth. You know, we look at this stuff and it just seems as if this is another, this is a people that have these issues involving their religion and then they're evil and we just need to attack them and so on and so forth. And they build up this hatred that Americans have for the Muslims and it's all created and they are at the top of it all. Plain and simple. They're at the top of it all. So we had to really get into all this so we can uh, really uh, set the stage for the rest of Ezra. So as I pointed out before, we know 
They mixed in, they spread to gain power in different civilizations. And once they gained power, they took over and these civilizations became European civilizations. This is exactly what happened in Europe, what they did to us, taking away uh, lands that belong to African people, as well as in North Africa, they took away these lands. And by mixing in, they can grow their numbers. And remember, back then, these people didn't have a notion of black and white because they understood what was going on. This was what the Europeans was doing to set up what they were eventually call, you know, different races. Who knows what they called it back then because they accepted that people who looked different and had different uh, shades of uh, color or darkness or what have you. So it was stupid to them, especially to uh, spiritual people. But um, we're going to get back now into the story. We're going to get back into Ezra, finish off Ezra and get into Nehemiah. So now all of this, I had to give you guys all this so you can understand the type of history they're trying to put forward to inject themselves uh, into history, into actual history, to make the Bible more valid. So in chapter 2, Ezra chapter 2, they get into, they name all of the families, everybody who returned from exile from all over the different countries and how they came back into um, uh, Israel and how they was returning from the Babylonian exile and um, basically, you know, going down to all the lineages and naming all the people, even people who couldn't prove there was actual Hebrews, but was claiming to be be Hebrews. They named them priests who were claiming to be priests, but couldn't be proven to be priests. They had to go through uh, like a little vetting process, but they was bringing them all back and they named cattle. I mean, they, they named everything. They named everything. All the people coming back in to Israel. Now, this is this is a big thing right here. This goes for the Hebrew Israelites, because now you got to look at this and the Hebrews, the Hebrew Israelites today, their claim, of course, is that we are in we were in exile when we got sent to America, so on and forth, so forth. We were in exile because we disobeyed the commandments of God. Now we have been reading the Bible, and all we have been reading is the Hebrews disobeying God's commandments. And by the way, if you hear construction outside, apologize for that little bit of noise. But we have seen the exile of the Jews sent all over the place. This is the difference right here. This is the big part. So when we when we speak about what Deuteronomy is talking about, how it pertains to African-American people. What would be the argument on the side of the white Hebrews? Because I've had this argument before with a white Jew. And his whole thing was, well, that's absurd because the Babylonian exile is the exile that Deuteronomy 20 is talking about. And we return from that just as God promised in Deuteronomy. So they're saying that, well, the exile to Babylon and us being scattered, you know, is what Deuteronomy is talking about. And here's the thing. When you read Deuteronomy 33, it says, Then the Lord, your God, will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. Now, that is the claim that the white Hebrews, the white Jews can make. They say, no, Deuteronomy 33 was fulfilled when we got, you know, released from Babylon. Now, who are we going to believe? Of course, we know. And you got to understand this is dualistic. It's, it's meant to fit both people. But um, the black Hebrews want to make it as if it fits only us when it clearly fits them as well. But they are us. You know, it's a big conundrum when you really think about it. But this is what gives it away. This is what makes it even more confusing. He will restore your riches. Do we have any fortunes restored? This is how you get them. Who had their fortunes restored? Remember, Cyrus gave them back all the money that Nebuchadnezzar took from them. He gave them all, all the money back. So, did we get any money? Did we get any fortunes restored to us after we got released from slavery? Where is our fortunes that we're supposed to have gotten? So, Deuteronomy, again, it fits both people. And this is how you can really get into their argument to really get them to understand that it's talking about both black and white people because as I've shown you guys, as I talked about, as I talked about many a times, they mutated from us, they come from us. We are basically the same people. But of course, the dark uh, Africans is the one who was first indoctrinated with Judaism before we spread it to everybody else. So now in the first three chapters of Ezra is getting into that whole, you know, all the people who came back, as I said, and found their way from the different countries back into uh, Judah and Israel. And it lists that for like the first three chapters, a bunch of names. But you have um, Cyrus saying that God told him to allow the uh, Jews to go and finish building a uh, temple. And um, they were supposed to get money and so on and so forth and a bunch of stuff to do this. And that's what they go and do. Now, the issue is you have the enemies of Israel who uh, 
thought God was supposed to have destroyed a couple times, but they still exist. And they're basically trying to stop the Hebrews from building this temple. So it says here, uh, Ezra 4. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asar, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So now basically what happens is, you know, they don't want them to build a temple. They go there to try to infiltrate them and be like, no, we're going to help you out so they can sabotage it. So uh, the Jews are like, no, we cool. You know, we're we, we going to build it ourselves. You know, the king said we could do so. So what they're going to do next is they're going to basically get together with the rest of the enemies and they're going to send a letter to Xerxes basically saying, or to Xerxes, uh, basically saying um, that the Jews are bad people, you know. They're not going to pay you tribute. They ain't going to pay you money. They're going to, you know, destroy you and overthrow you, so on and so forth, to try to get him to basically, um, you know, stop him from building. So it says in 8, real quick, it says, Rehum, the chancellor of Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, king of this sort. So now what Artaxerxes says is basically, show me a law that says they can't build, you know. This is what God told me to, to let them do. So I'm going to do it. So unless you can produce some kind of law or something like that that says they can't do it, I'm going to let them do it. So they go back to building. But the people come back out and stop them by force this time. Literally stop them and halt them for basically years. And years go by. And now you have Darius on the throne. And then uh, eventually the Hebrews try to start building again. And then people go in and they like, you know, what are you guys doing? And they say, we are doing what's basically we are allowed to do and that's to build this temple it's been too long they've been stopped so they go and inquire with Darius now to go and check and see if they have permission to build this temple Darius basically goes to his people and like hey I need y'all to go through the royal records and see that was it a decree to allow the Hebrews to build this temple so they do so and they find you know yeah Artaxerxes said they can build it so Darius comes out and he's like yo not only are you going to allow them to build, but you're going to give them everything they need to build. All the money they need, any cattle they need, so on and so forth. And you're going to leave them alone and allow them, and allow them to build. So now Darius basically tells them, you know, anybody who tries to stop the Hebrews, uh, may they have a tree fall on their house and uh, they're going to be hanged, basically. So basically leave the people alone. Now, one of the things you're going to see when you're reading in Ezra is it's going to be confusing because they keep making these references to Darius and Artaxerxes seeming as if they are the same person or as if they was ruling around the same same time but it's almost like the same situation remember they related a family but it's almost like the same situation where you have judah and uh jerusalem or judah and israel and you have a king in each one it's basically what's the same it's the same as upper egypt and uh lower egypt you have two rulers so when they refer to them as at one point the same time they're ruling but of course one over the uh, uh one would succeed the other so the thing is, we're talking about real people. Talk about Cyrus, king of Persia, real person. You're talking about Darius, real person, existing. And um, the thing is, how is it that we're talking about a decree? There's so much going on. There's so much recorded history happening, even around now, for not anyone to mention it. Herodotus never mentions any of this and he has a whole big giant history of the Persians where he doesn't mention not one time not once he doesn't mention anything about Darius and the Jews or Artaxerxes and the Jews you got to think about that so one yeah Herodotus lived during the time of Artaxerxes which Artaxerxes died in, I believe it's 324 the year before Herodotus died which was 325 I mean 424 excuse me and 425 uh, BCE. So Herodotus lived one year after Artaxerxes had died. He had did a big 
history on the Persians where he talks about Cyrus and Artaxerxes but does not mention no Hebrews and that's important because next you have Artaxerxes it says in Ezra Artaxerxes uh, in the Bible basically gives Ezra and the Hebrews a pass because understand remember they are ruling Judah they are ruling these lands they are ruling Jerusalem so they need pass to go back and forth basically you know to move freely in that large group so not only does Artaxerxes gives he gives Ezra money. He gives them like passes, like decrees, notes, to, so they can get to Judah. So I'm going to get to Jerusalem because Artaxerxes tells Ezra, okay, I want you to gather your people, uh, anybody who can go with you that's supposed to go, and I want you to take this money and take the supplies and take these decrees, and I want you to go to Jerusalem and teach the people the law of your God. And it's like, okay. They have to do this because they have to explain, they have to explain, excuse me, how in the world during this time the Persians are conquering of everything that the Jews were able to, sp to spread Judaism how are they going around doing all this stuff and this is how they put that in there now as I'm going to talk about and as I talked about before they created these people these are created people they are in my opinion and in other people's opinions who have researched this deeply they created and controlled these people as we'll get into so they can put anything they want. You know, history is written by the conquerors, not the conquered. They can make it seem as if anything, but there is no proof to back up these claims. There's nothing to back up what's being said here in the Bible, especially when you have something like a decree that's going to be giving these people permission to move freely. There should have been some type of documentation or something, somebody talking about these Hebrews traveling freely and spreading this word, but it's nothing. So now what are these laws? And we talked about this before. It's the same thing we have with our judicial court system. And as I said before, they have to establish this. This is a big part right here for them to establish the fact that laws are needed. You get what I'm saying? Like there is laws. And if you're a religious person, you can say, well, they had to obey laws and they had to obey government and they have to obey somebody ruling over them that was seemingly a good person. So we can look at our situation and be like, well, you know, just like um, um, uh, the king said, you know, maybe this is what God wants to happen. You know, um, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was like, yeah, you know, he said Babylonians going to have all this stuff soon. Hezekiah was like, so what? You know, if, that, if that's what God wants, that's what it should be. And this is how a lot of people think, religious people think in that way. Like, this is what God must want to happen because he put these people in charge. So they have to give us this stuff. So when we read Ezra, this is 7-11, it says, Now this is a copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Statutes is, what, is what's bullshit. It's not law. It's just man's law. And thou Ezra, this is 25, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God. And teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. How is that different from what we have today? It's the same stuff. You know, you get locked up, you get you know, your stuff confiscated, you can get sentenced to death, so on and so forth. It's the same system. And it's very, I mean, to say judges and magistrates, that that takes care of Europe, that takes care of America. Right there, boom, judges and magistrates. So clear as day, and remember, this was written 1604, 1611, when this stuff was already going on. So clear as day, you have them establishing a legal precedence right there in the Bible that's supposed to be ancient. And then us looking at this and saying, hmm, because... Any free thinking person would say to themselves, who the fuck are you to tell me this? Who are you? Now, I'm going to abide by human law, plain and simple. I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to kill you. You know, I'm not going to renege on any contracts between us. That's basically law right there. It's nothing else. Basically, do unto others as, as you would have done, you know, unto you. So, you know, don't rape, you know, don't beat nobody up so on and so forth natural easy stuff i'm not going to cause any bodily harm to you you don't to me i'm not going to steal from you i'm not going to renege on any contracts so we come into an agreement together which people don't understand how 
big that is an agreement is spiritual that's a big deal if we agree on something you can't break that and that's just something that has always existed so as long as man is not breaking that those are the true laws all these statutes and codes and everything like that it's a bunch of bullshit that man made up so now the problem is you know you have a lot of these hebrews and religious people who don't want to accept common sense i mean they want to accept anything that's going to support their doctrine but nothing that doesn't you know easily explain you know something else and this easily is easily explains that something is up and that it couldn't be possible for something so huge and important as what the hebrews are doing in the bible to not be mentioned by anyone